um, I think Phil set us off to a fantastic start. I mean, there was so much in there that I thought, wow. Um, he also let me off the hook, I told him, because when he said that the evaluators were so terrible at doing evaluations on responsible innovation, I thought, oh, well, that's fine. Then I don't have to be an expert on it either. Um, and in fact, that was a little bit my dilemma with this presentation that I thought, gee, do I really have to first understand responsible innovation before I can say something sensible? And I decided that if it's your lifetime's work, I certainly couldn't do it in the space of a few months. And um, I decided to go back to the very, the, the real inspiration for the theme and why we came to this, which was not at all responsible innovation. So, um, and, and, and it tells you a bit about my journey, about why, why I think there's so much to be gained from this theme for our profession. And when I say our profession, I do mean the M&E profession, um, to which I've come about, you know, about 10 years ago or so, where I think there's an incredible amount that needs to move. All right. I decided to zoom in on four considerations for M&E. Uh, there's, there's about 25, I think, that you could unpick and, and look at from Phil's presentation, but just four and one challenge at the end, to which we'll be returning at the end of tomorrow. For each of the considerations, I want to just say, well, what, how do I understand it? Um, give a few examples from, in terms of the M&E challenges and also to dig into the toolbox because we don't have to start from scratch. I think that there's a lot of uh, innovation in evaluation that I think we can make much better use of um, if, we, if we want to. Okay, so why this theme? Last year, I spent a little bit of time on the road going to these conferences. Uh, there was an international evaluation conference in Darwin. Uh, that was the first one in September. And it focused on unleashing the power of evaluation. There was one after that in Dublin, where quite a few of you were also present, which was focusing on equity. And then there was one um, which was uh, quite amazing in the US on something they called visionary evaluation, which was focusing on sustainability. And what I found really interesting in these themes, in these, in these conferences, was that the theme was a, was, was inf it was really, they were really infused by societal urgency. A lot of these conferences can be about mixed methods or impact assessment or uh, something technical related to M&E. But they, these conferences, for the first time in my experience, were really infused by a sense that we have not got time to lose. So I left with a strong sense of urgency. For example, in uh, Darwin uh, was where I met Per Mikwitz, who, who was uh, one of our key ins inspirational sources, his quote. And he was saying, we really don't have time to lose. And it's not just about innovation. It's really about systemic transformation. So he even trashes the concept. He, well, he doesn't trash it, but he says innovation is, is just not enough. We need much more. And in fact, a lot about, I, I picked up in Phil's presentation and a lot of your references were with how do you do systemic analysis um, prior to actually engaging with the systemic change process. Um, in Darwin, uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of Jean King. She's a very wise and experienced um, evaluator who's always gone for ethics. And she says, gosh, if I look back now, she's just about you know, in entering retirement. She says, if I look back now, the world's much worse off than when I started. So what is the power that we have to make that difference? What power do I have in my little role? Um, and I think that the torch is an attempt by the many professional world to say, well, actually, evaluation does have a lot that it can add. But it needs to come out of hiding you know, it needs to come out of this, oh, well, you know, what's your job description? Or what do you want to do? Oh, well, you can be the M&E person, right? It, I remember working with IFAD in a couple of, oh, about 10, 15 years ago now. And, um, and the M&E place was the person, was the place where you would go to get, if you had a demotion. Yeah, it was not the place. If you wanted to really change the system. So I think that this notion of power of our valuation is really critical. Um, I'm going to skip over, over Dublin in the interest of time, but at, um, I guess my takeaway from the one in, in, um, in Denver, which was on visionary evaluation, was there was an incredible amount of talk there about planetary boundaries um, and a lot of uh, discussion about two big topics for me. It's everything you're hearing is through, filtered through my eyes was and ears was um, about the, the role of business, and I'll come back to that in a minute, 
So all this, this huge innovation area that we're experiencing in innovation develop in, in development around PPPs, public-private private, private partnerships, was a huge topic there, but also impact investing. I don't know how many of you are engaged, or how many of you have heard of impact investment? A handful, how many of you are involved in inv impact investment? One, two, three. We're, we're dealing with nothing when we're dealing with projects. We're dealing with nothing when we're dealing with bilateral aid agencies or NGOs. Impact investment is trillions of dollars worth of money um, that has a very different time perspective on change, and they really clash with this notion of systemic transformation. But I'll come back to that in a minute. So, so there, were, um, there was this strong sense of urgency, and I, when we were talking about the theme for this year, uh, we thought, well, can it be about mixed methods? Mm. Can it be about innovation? I thought, well, maybe. We, we first, I, I, I was really keen to focus on the systemic transformation um, issue, and we discussed this diagram a lot in terms of whether or not it could inspire us, but we felt it was too, sm too difficult to put on the brochure uh, because it was, <laughs> it was gonna be so tiny. <laughs> but essentially, this is the urgency. So the, it's about systemic transformation. We've really hit the wall. And uh, this is a very, very much reproduced um, uh, diagram that looks at all the different aspects of our um, what we need for a safe planet and in which areas we've gone <laughs> over the limits. And there's quite a few, all the red areas where the limits are being breached. Hence, of course, issues like geoengineering, some of the examples, gene genetically modified foods, um, organisms rather. So, um, so when then we said, well, let's, you know, systemic transformation is quite difficult to sell, and we also have to be very pragmatic because there is a huge political economy around uh, monitoring and evaluation that we have to be very, very mindful of, and I'll come back to that as well. Um, so we then said, okay, innovation, and as, as um, uh, but it wasn't just innovation, but it was for innovation and responsible innovation. So I am not an expert on responsible innovation, but I'm concerned uh, for systemic transformation. How do we do that? So that's what's driving me and my interests here. So, coffee. You've all just had coffee. So up in the top left hand, we have somebody that some of us uh, have seen in movies. And I thought the caption was really quite interesting. Nespresso, what else? Like, I can't do a George Clooney, but. Um, and what else indeed? Uh, last week, I think it was last week in The Guardian, I read that, um, I'm trying to remember his name, John, uh, John Sylvan, he invented the original K-cups. And K-cups are the little cups that are also in the in Nespresso kind of machines that um, have been picked up by lots of other kind of, um, lot, lots of other coffee producers, or coffee machines and coffee producers. And um, he wishes, and the interview was about how he wished he had never invented the K-cups. Because he doesn't, he's, he stepped out of the company, he doesn't even own a machine that was part of his company. He says because the landfill issues as a result of these K-cups is just unbelievable. Um, you can recycle them, but it's a voluntary basis and there's no systems and it's very complicated apparently with two layers of plastic. And so the question really is about what else indeed. I mean, could he have, this was a, an innovation that wasn't thought through beforehand, um, could he have done, uh, thought through it beforehand following some of the guidance that we've heard from, from, um, from Phil and actually come to the conclusion that perhaps that was a balloon that should not be put up in the air? Um, I mean, for better or for worse, in international development, there's a lot of these painful lessons. I mean, child sponsorship, which was very, very big in the 80s, 90s, um, great for the individual child, really problematic for the com community. Again, it's about the system. It's about the systemic boundaries. Where, what do you look at? Um, um, these PPPs, I was chatting with my husband who works a lot on agriculture value chains, an old colleague of Simona's, and he says that, well, there are quite a few cases uh, that are being discussed about the consequences of, of, in terms of gender relations because the income that women are receiving um, as a result of being more involved in inclusive markets also is leading to more domestic violence. So again, it's a systemic question of if you're looking only at 
the thing that you set out to do, and that is the problem with a lot of the M&E work. We are contracted to tick the box about whether or not the project has done what it said it would do. It's a very backward looking, and I think that's the challenge, not a forward looking, and we're not asked to stretch the boundaries of the questions that are asked for the, the, um, the subject. I was at, um, it was also in Darwin where I bumped into somebody called Dorothy Lukes who was do, had done an IFAD evaluation on natural, I think it was natural resource management in the Philippines. And she found that um, what had been fantastic, you know, a really fantastic success of the program, the project program, I don't know what term they use in IFAD nowadays, but was that um, uh, as a result of engaging with um, indigenous communities, they had become more aware of the need to register their rights to the lands, which in turn had led them to more ownership of the lands, which in turn had closed the cycle of more cautious natural resource management. But the IFAD project was not uh, intended to increase land ownership of indigenous people. So she was not allowed to include that in her report. So, so, um, so she found other ways through kind of informal communication and in footnotes and kind of slipping in, um, you know, in not, not in the recommendations or in the executive summary, God forbid, but um, to kind of include this, this fantastic success, but really constrained by the mandate that the m and &E profession sets. We make things a thing, we make a process of change a thing, we are then be asking people to hold themselves accountable to that thing. And that's a really, really difficult challenge for us, I think. Okay, um, I'm gonna show a slide now. Okay, so then, so Mikwitz, um, this was the quote that I really took away. Can we step up and can we stretch those boundaries? Can we start to ask different questions? Can we engage with the commissioners of the work that we do? Can we engage with how we do it, our competencies, the way we do it, to uh, not just <coughs> make the journey marginally better, but to really make it a different journey. Okay, so innovation. I'm not gonna dwell on, on the definition. Um, I mean, basically for me, it's about, it's very relative concept to start with. Yeah, so like, like Cecile said, an innovation for her is not an innovation for me. Um, for how many of you have heard of most significant change method? Okay, that is still, in the heading of books and, ch and articles under the, the chapter innovation. Rick Davies developed this in 1994, or earlier actually, he wrote it up in 1994, and we're still considering it an innovation 20, 20 years later. So, but it's essentially, I'm, I'm talking about a change in a process, a service, a product, or even a relationship, that was the example that we were discussing this morning, where it, it, it's new in context. Yeah, or it's new in combination. Um, and it doesn't have to happen through Eurekas, of course. And I think that's part, isn't it? it's, not, all, it's about not necessarily about balloons in the sky, which is a kind of a Eureka concept almost. Um, and I'll come back to the time frame issue as one of my four considerations. It can be very incremental, um, additive. You know, you're just adding something onto an innovation process. So it becomes a small little thing that you look at and see how does the system change. It can be complementary to existing innovations or the breakthrough. And I think part of our challenge is that we want to may perhaps look at these breakthrough moments, but a lot of us are involved in very incremental, small, long-term types of changes. Um, one of the um, terms that are popping up in the field of innovation uh, quite a lot, uh, many of you here have also attended uh, sessions around complexity and m and &E, which is, uh, I think, part of this whole paradigm of thinking about systems and interdependencies and relationships, um, is this notion of needing to fail faster. And what many of, of you who've been in the business for a while have been doing for a long time, now Harvard professors have named it. So, yeah, now it exists. <laughs> um, it's called Problem Driven Iterative Adaptation. Okay, PDIA, you can look it up, published by the CDG. Um, but this notion that we do need to have cycles of experimentation, which is why I was very interested in the responsible innovation, how can you do those cycles of experimentation more responsibly and reflexively? We've got a paper here as well on reflexive monitoring, which we'll, um, we'll speak to that, so look that up in the program. 
and it's very risky. Utility is really unclear. And again, I think this clashes with what the M&E profession is told it has to do. We need to deliver. And if we don't deliver, there's a problem. Um, I've had the uh, mixed fortune of uh, engaging with the Depar Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Australia, um, who in their wisdom have said that uh, 4.8 billion worth of their investments is what they don't call innovation, and I think 200 million or so, no, 400 million, so 4.6 billion is, is kind of normal, and they've got this, this project, or this, this fund, they're calling the Innovation Fund, uh, which has got that, that, that idea of it being different. And they're trying to figure out how to hold themselves accountable um, in, in, a, in an integrated way, given that the $4.6 billion, they have just decided that if it doesn't perform within a year, it's gonna be cut. Now, I don't know how many of you <laughs> working in international development can see the difficulty of this when in the first year you're lucky if you have a working computer um, and some partnerships where you really need to have these long time frames for change. And so there's these, this weird discussion going on about innovation in the development, which I think is, is quite problematic. When it hits the, the results logics, it, it, it's just a bad fit. Yeah, I think we have a long way to go there. I think it's one of the challenges that um, um, Phil raised. Okay, this is a, um, I uh, I'll in, the, in the formal, the last version I'll put in the, the reference, I don't expect you to understand the diagram, but it's just a, a, a kind of an image to hold in mind. If we're interested in systemic change, we need to understand transitions. And this is what Per Mikwitz also talked about in, um, in his, in his uh, presentation. This is actually from somebody else called Gales. He says that there's a technological niche uh, which then hits a socio-technical, -techni he calls it a regime, context, and there's a lot that happens there. And then you get into what, he what, what is called the landscape development. So you have a whole transition period of innovation, and I, I, I like that notion. I mean, I, I don't care what the diagram looks like, but this notion that we are in a, in a process where we've got, we're responding to landscape pressure. Okay, this is a natural resource management terminology, but you could also say social pressure. We're responding to that. Uh, we're destabilizing a dominant system. So there's gonna be pushback. There's going to be um, issues around monitoring and evaluation there. How do you look at those issues? Do we, do, are we only gonna track what it is we're setting out to do? Or are we also tracking the destabilization and the knock-on effects of that um, in terms of our, our work? And then the variation, what they call variation, maturing niches and selection. So what gets pooped out at the end, if you will, um, in terms of the thing yeah, that we measure. So I don't think we're good at transition thinking in uh, international development. Yeah, We just do it, and it's supposed to deliver. So um, this is not meant to caricature, be a caricature of research at all, Phil. <laughs> but I thought it was a cute little diagram, um, because the responsible innovation uh, notion is very strongly uh, driven or kind of informed by science. And a lot of us are dealing with innovations of very, very different kinds. So let me just mention a few of those. And I'm sure you recognize many of these. Okay, so here's a, a landscape, and it's just a tiny little landscape of a whole range of different types of innovations, at least one of whom is sitting in the room. Let me start with that. So, we have the, land, we have the um, changes in, um, I don't know, would you call them economic changes, Steph? Um, where you're trying to, the public partner, public private partnerships, where you're trying to shift the business models. That's the one in the Mars and Fredes Eilanden, that's a, a Belgian NGO. That is an innovation in terms of different kinds of engagement, uh, different types, types of, um, of interests that are kind of being merged, but I was chatting with, with um, Simona this morning about this type of example. She's saying, well, the innovation is in the relationships where we're really not there yet, where we're seeing a lot of innovation in terms of different types of, um, well, information systems being used actively or um, 
in terms of different types of pricing systems systemically. So that's one type of innovation that we're dealing with in development. We've got another in the bottom right-hand corner, which is Pueza in Tanzania, but also a very large um, one called Making All Voices Count that uh, Carol, you don't hide, Hivos is involved in in the back there. And it's really, it's a political innovation. So there's a lot of innovation happening or change happening to try and figure out, can state and citizen, can they interact differently? Can budgets be transparent? Can there be different types of relationships to decide on um, holding the state accountable? Um, last year I was in Indonesia where there was a whole network of people working on what they call transparency and accountability initiatives. And they were really stumped because they were they were, they were needing to deal with, with these transition processes that they were in. They were needing to have the freedom to learn and question, uh, but they were also really, um, I suppose, scarred by the system that they were locked into. For example, we had a really fascinating discussion about budgets. So the if, and budget transparency. How many of you work with budget transparency a little bit? two, three, four, I might need to explain that a little bit more then. This notion that um, if citizens can have access to budgets and learn how to read budgets, um, at whether it's at community or district or, um, uh, well, national level, they can then have, they have a tool for challenging why money is not going to where it should be going, right? And, um, and the question, the questions we were discussing with, well, why, why are we focusing only on that mechanism? Whereas if the question is about being socially accountable, surely there's a whole range of other strategies to get there rather than only through budget trans transparency. But then you get into uh, the dynamics of international development where um, certain kinds of established practices are, pr are preferred and are, are funded. People fund a training workshop, people fund um, perhaps now a budget transparency project. They, people fund, in the beginning, getting funding for PPPs was not that easy. Now, wow, you know, if you can get, if you, if you have a PPP proposal, fine. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're not asking questions necessarily about their efficacy. And that in those discussions, it was turning out that some of the budget work was actually not really that um, good at dealing with some of the deeper issues around social accountability. We have um, Ashoka and Acumen, um, a lot of social entrepreneurship as a huge field of change. Swiss Re and Oxfam, Swiss Re is a very large insurer. Uh, they're working on different types of financial inclusion. I, put, I should have put Microsoft, not Microsoft, Mac, MasterCard Foundation up there as well, with whom I'm working. They're doing a lot of innovation around financial inclusion. Um, the point being that we're dealing with uh, change processes that are long-term, new relationships, different norms that are clashing, different kinds of expectations and experiences around monitoring and evaluation, and it's, it's quite complicated. Um, a little story about award. Who knows about award, which is this uh, funding proce pr process in Africa for uh, s researchers? Sylvester, you know about them? Jan, as well. It's fantastic. It's touted as the example of how to do reflexive uh, journaling, capacity building, and all the adjectives you would like you know, for monitoring and evaluation. However, and this comes back to what are you asking of the system, when I ask them wh what, what kind of research these, it's, it's basically it's training and trying to push forward and create opportunities for women scientists in the agricultural sphere in, in, and they've got hundreds now that they've gone through PhDs and they're in positions that are great. But they're not tracking what kind of research these, these women are doing. So we don't know if the net effect is anything um, other than a personal uh, gain, but is actually contributing to um, equity or sustainability. Mm -hmm. So that was put off for the impact evaluation. So here we come into the limitations of how we frame some of these, these issues. Okay, moving on. Where is that one blank? So the questions that I'm, I'm not actually interested in monitoring and evaluation so much. I'm interested, I'm not actually interested in innovation that much, but for me the two words that are really interesting that I think that for ha throw up a challenge for us is the, the word for and the word responsible. Because I think what they do is they, uh, they force us to say, uh, 
what else do we need besides our existing arsenal, I guess, and our existing frameworks and our existing practices with monitoring and evaluation that get us to that four position and that force us to look at responsible? And what we're doing is pretty good. You know, we do good stuff in general <laughs> on uh, ticking the boxes, being accountable and liable, but what uh, Phil was also mentioning, those things are done well. It's not bad, but it's not enough. Okay, moving on to the considerations. And I think this one is really important. I did a, a trawl of the American Evaluation Journal, um, and there's another one for Europe, the Journal of Evaluation Planning. Extremely few mentions of innovation. Very, very little discussion about what that particular subject means for the ME practice. And where you do find it, it's much more the ME of innovation. And then it you know, is back, it's framed in terms of did they innovate what they said they would do? And I'm certainly getting warmer now, which is great. It was very cold room before. Good. Take starting with the first one. Um, <coughs> oh, sorry, sorry, these are the four that I want to talk about. Responsible goals, time frame, the unintended and use. And you'll have to figure out how you're gonna link them to fills. The first one I think is the most most obvious link. Um, so the first one is what are the questions that we ask? Um, did they do what they said they would do? Or where is this all taking us? So I've been involved in uh, some work with IFAD where they have, they have structured, IFAD is the International Fund for Agricultural Development, and their m and &E systems are such that they have been quite good at ticking the boxes, but this is what they said to us. They aren't actually asking the questions that matter. This is a pretty, pretty big thing to, to say as the biggest funder of agricultural uh, development in the world. So they're trying to figure out what kind of non-threatening processes, I think that's a big issue in the field of evaluation, what kind of non-threatening processes that can they, can they um, develop and foster, pilot, and, and kind of then institutionalize that get them exactly to this, to this second question. If we continue with this, where are we gonna end up? If we continue with, and I'll give you an example of a PPP in Vietnam in a minute, if we continue funding this kind of work in that southern province in Vietnam, what is it going to do in terms of the questions around society and um, the planet? <coughs> so at, my, uh, at the conference in, um, in Denver, last, uh, Denver last year, the American Evaluation one, there's a fantastic guy called Bob, Bob Willard who used to work at IBM and um, has now become f solely focused on trying to deal with sustainability um, issues. And he says we have to look at, that's why business is in the middle, but you could put any kind of change in the middle, right? You could put um, any, any of your initiatives you could put in that middle. It's, they're nested interdependencies, and we're not very aware of, of those. We're not asked to investigate those. He, his words, society and business are wholly owned subsidiaries of the environment. And if you muck up the environment, you're gonna muck up society and you're gonna muck up your business. So business get real because there are feedback loops. You have boomerang impacts. And you know, the Nespresso example was one of those. Uh, how can we start to build our M&E systems to really think in terms of those nested inter interdependencies? The questions we ask at the level of business or an initiative would be, is it going well? Is it delivering what it said it would do? Are 180,000, uh, 372 farmers now able to produce 10 liters of milk more a year or not? But then in terms of society, what is that more milk doing? For whom? In terms of environment, gosh, all these cows also need a lot of soya from Brazil. Yeah, that's a question we could have asked in the Netherlands a while ago, right? Yep, now we have to deal with our water quality. Um, so this type of, of notion of these goals, how do we frame the goals in terms of how the, um, how the interdependencies are nested? Also in Denver was a fascinating presentation by um, Interface. You might have carpets from Interface without knowing it. It's a carpet company. And um, in January 2015, in their Dutch plant, they finally have 100% renewable energy virtually zero uh, wastewater and no landfill. But this has been a process in this company of over 20 years. Their founding father, the, or the, the owner at the time, Ray, I can't remember his surname, 
it's a very interesting story, um, said it's got to be more about than not just, it's got to be about more than just doing no harm. Doing no harm is a little bit of a mantra in international development, yeah, as long as you don't uh, do any harm. But he said it's got to be about doing good, yeah? It's got to be about adding to the quality of life for people and to the quality of the environment. And so one of the carpets they produce is called Networks. It's quite a cute little pun or wordplay once you know where, where it's from. So they work with fishing communities in uh, Southeast Asia. There's a lot of plastic in the sea, yeah? Huge amounts of plastic in the sea. And a lot of, some of that plastic is uh, recycled or mis, you know, just kind of fishing nets that are discarded. And so what they are now doing, they're providing an incentive to these fisher communities to collect as much plastic as they can that are then used in their factories to produce carpets. And so they say they're leaving the environment cleaner, they're leaving the uh, fisher people richer, and they're also making people more aware about how this is all interconnected. And they're uh, list, a listed company, so they're, I think they're one very, very large. I don't know exactly how large they are, but they're huge. And they have a very different type of goal, was my point with this. So their goal is not just CSR or do no harm, but do good. So what's at our fingertips? Um, from an evaluation perspective. Uh, many of you will have heard of theory of change. <laughs> Sorry, this is an insider joke for those of you who are not in the M&E community. Um, and there's a reason why they're important. I hope what I just said is part of that. But I still think we're not going far enough with that. We're not asking about, and I thought your, you had a fantastic table, Phil which was the table, and you had showed a few, I'm trying to remember which one it was, where you said uh, it was process, product, purpose. That's right. There are a lot of questions in there that we could use at this stage in the theory of change development that could really help us think through that one step further in terms of what do we think are the consequences likely to be of this thing that we're proposing. We don't do that well enough yet. All we do in our theory of change, of wh on which I'm giving a workshop next week, so Carl, you can hold me accountable to my new framing, um, is um, what is the problem, where can we intervene? That's how they're traditionally framed, but not what are the consequences of this. We don't do scenario analysis of, well, if we can intervene here or if we intervene there. We don't think ahead like that. I put up participatory indicator development because that's a known thing, but in fact, more participatory development of M&E systems is actually really critical. It was a fad a little bit in the 1990s, kind of died a little quiet death, um, and lo and behold, it's coming up again a little bit more these days. Um, Human-centric design, um, that's a concept, you mentioned, you used a different word for that. Uh, but essentially, it's about getting much more engagement in the design of initiatives, Citizen juries in the m and &E world are known for kind of more testimony after the fact, but you could do that beforehand as part of your theory of change development. And one that I think we're really weak on, and it's part of our, our disconnect, our, our mental disconnect, because we look at the past with m and &E. We don't look at the future, which was your big challenge. How do we build foresight studies into some of this work? How do we do much more scenario thinking um, prior to uh, actually getting to the indicators and the accountability that we're kind of paid to do. And um, <clears throat> the HIVOS uh, work we've been involved in for years, uh, for a few years now, they've kind of moved, uh, Carol can tell you more about that if, uh, over, over coffee, but they've actually come back to theory of change because when you only deal with the indicators and the evaluation questions, it's too little too late. You've got to grab. You've got to grab it at the start, and so this notion of responsible goals is really, really crucial. I believe um, ODI published a paper on a only a couple couple of months ago by Ben Ramalingam. I, you might have seen it on Wicked, something with Wicked problems. I can't remember. And what they were testing were m and &E methods to deal with complexity. And what I found really interesting when I looked at it, I, they were almost all of them were planning approaches. Because they also said, well, the problems start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So we need much more systems analysis. We need to figure out uh, networks and the consequences in relationships as a result of this work. So, um, I mean, the list could go on, but this is, these are some of the things we have at our fingertips. So then time frame, when does innovation stop? 
and I find that an interesting one because it kind of is a bit of a, it jars a bit with research. Um, this is one that I pulled from some of Schoenberg's case studies, uh, a social alarm buttons project where you can see the M&E was field trials and visits and interviews and then they reached the final project design and it was considered desirable by, by end users. And I think, well, this contrasts with uh, processes that I've mentioned where, um, you know, for example, this one is, is work with uh, slum dwellers that started in 1974, and it doesn't stop, basically. Innovation never ends because you're constantly dealing with the next systemic change, change process. And so it's really about a betting evaluation in, um, in the way in which you're dealing with the, th these innovation, the innovation process. So what do we have at our fingertips? We have an incredible, huge, frenzied interest in feedback loops. Feedback this, mechanisms, feedback labs exist. I don't know how many of you knew about that. Um, something called rubrics and developmental evaluation, which, we've, uh, which is quite well known by now about dealing specifically with an embedded evaluation function within innovation processes. Um, <coughs> so the rubrics, I think, are really interesting, and they, were, they also link quite closely to yours, where you're saying, well, what it has to do with what you call the normative anchor points. So what is it that you're holding yourself accountable to um, in this innovation process, even if it, as it changes? And this is just an example of rubrics we've been developing with uh, the MasterCard Foundation that is saying the financial inclusion work has to be based on voice. And so they're taking an evaluative criterion, you know, which is a, a so-called anchor point, a norm, um, that it's got to be about the right people, diverse views, et cetera. And then they're saying, well, how can we judge where we are in this process from not yet, uh, not yet emerging in the work that we fund to comprehensive? How can we push our own foundation, uh, foundational intent for human-centered design um, that includes uh, this type of evaluation perspective. Okay, some of you have seen this. This is li a little pet project of mine, um, the notion of surprise. And I think it matches quite well with what you were saying. So Mark Twain says, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble, which I disagree with, by the way. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Okay, so these, these w and it was your example of framings. You think there's only one way to look at a problem, and that's it, you're locked in. How can you break out of that? So, surprise. There's a couple of Italians, um, they're psychologists, mm -hmm. that have worked on the notion of surprise a little bit. And this is my learning from this, is that you essentially have two types of surprise. You have a mismatch-based surprise, and you have what they call astonishment type of surprise. A lot of M&E work focuses on mismatch-based surprise. What did you intend? What did you get? Is there a match? Almost all the terms of reference say, don't forget unintended consequences, right? You know that one. Um, but there's no, we, we're methodologically really poor on how to deal with the unanticipated out of the blue type surprises because we don't ask those questions. We don't even know how to start. And we're not held accountable to them. So, um, Doing business with the rural poor. This was an initiative on public-private partnerships in south southern Vietnam. Uh, various types of short value chain shrimp, coconuts, and um, garden gar uh, kind of ornamental plants. To make a very long story short, we did an impact of assessment, and this was our mismatched, just as an example of a mismatch-based surprise. They said that they were going to deliver better incomes for the poor. And while we did see that in our survey, we also asked people whether their increase, whether their incomes had increased uh, or, or decreased over time. So it was how they were perceiving their increase or decrease. You can see the top, ha top half is the non-project and the bottom half is the project households. The poor households um, n noted a very, very uh, substantially greater decrease in their incomes than, um, than those, for example, uh, than the non-poor, but also than the poor in the non-poor households. Whereas the non-poor and the near-poor, this is their categories, by the way, 
um, noted a, a much greater increase than the poor. So this is just an example of a mismatch where we could say, okay, guys, what are you guys doing that could possibly lead to this? Yeah. So on their own equity uh, standard, they weren't really um, go getting, very, getting very far. But then when we dug deeper and looked more systemically at what this shrimp farming was doing to their system, we found that environmental impacts, the, I suppose these are the more kind of onion shaped as a tomato type surprises. They had to use a certain kind of chemical in their shrimp farming that was really making, uh, causing a lot of allergies. Um, and they were, and was polluting the waterways. And so, and so that meant that they couldn't drink some of the water and more diseases, blah, et cetera. And so sustainability wasn't really on the horizon of this public-private partnership. And so that was a small example, but for the project, oh gosh, we really need to think about this, this issue. We need to think and draw the system wider and not just look at these equity questions. So what do we have at our imp fingertips? Impact evaluation in all its forms. Um, assumptions thinking. Those, I, won't, I won't go into depth about that, but I think assumptions are critical to how we hold ourselves accountable to uh, the surprises. The more you can articulate the assumptions, the more you can hold yourselves accountable to getting information that upholds them or not, and people's experiences. Listening, listening, listening. And then, of course, feedback and, f and theory of change as well. Voices at scale, little pet project of mine. Okay, the final one. Um, people don't like to hear the message of the M&E uh, crowd, usually, right? We get a kind of a fight or flight type reaction. Oh, can't be true. Or, oh gosh, um, you know, as a commissioner or as a funder, oh well, let's scrap that project then, right? And so I think that we have a, our M&E uh, toolbox is very weak on dealing with these quite extreme processes. How do we negotiate and discuss and make sense? What focus, what process? So we've got to have many more processes, I think, uh, and the round table this afternoon on sense making is gonna be one opportunity to talk about that. We don't, we're not very good at ways of, of making sense. And that again has to do with the, the M&E profession, which has said that it's gotta be objective. We've gotta be isolated, we've gotta be independent. And so making sense together is uh, very problematic often in your terms of reference. Bethany, you're from um, Clear Horizon. They've been pioneering fantastic stuff on something called collaborative outcome. I don't know what it's called these days, but I know it as collaborative outcome reporting technique, which is a fascinating way to make sense and get it vetted by um, uh, citizens to really uh, try to get the findings um, agreed, but also owned by, by different people. <coughs> so, um, Rounding off then, we've got, um, and this, this is a question I guess I have a little bit to fill because what I wasn't sure about was in responsible innovation, it sounded like quite a few of the questions, maybe it was just in the process and product columns, were really about the quality of the innovation process. Whereas I think that a lot of my takeaways from the discussions in that I've been following over the, the past year in particular is much broader. It's that maybe be more the purpose mm -hmm. column. It's the blue, it's the societal and environmental if effects of the innovation in situ. So I think that the M&E can focus on both of those things. Yeah, but I think that we've got to figure out wha what that, um, how that might look differently. Um, here's an example of sense making that we were trying in Vietnam, extremely difficult across languages and power relationships and diversity. There's some good examples. I think that the Vico is going to talk about some of their work um, in sense making as well um, tomorrow, I believe. I think it's a real frontier for us. Okay, so we have at our fingertips utilization focused evaluation a lot, and Cecile has written about that, organizational learning. A lot of work on participatory analysis and something called participatory numbers that's been coming up a bit more. So we don't have to start at scratch. So this is just a little app, to kind of to whet your appetite for tomorrow afternoon. If we could imagine an m and &E practice that actively supports and pursues responsible innovation, what would it look like? 
and I'm stealing deeply from Patton with this little table. Uh, Michael Quinn Patton, who's very well known in the M&E world, had a great presentation at the American Evaluation Society last year where he said, come on guys, ideas get out of date. Yeah, let's retire a few of them. Let's allow them their kind of old age. And so we um, brainstormed as a group, what are ideas that need to be retired and what are ideas and M&E practices that need to be elevated if we want to get to that vision of M&E for responsible innovation? And here's a couple that I have writ written down, but we're gonna do that tomorrow as a group. So, let's dive in. Uh, my name is uh, Rahmatullah from Afghanistan. My question is uh, about uh, what are mm, the major challenges to make uh, a responsible Imini for a responsible innovation. Thanks a lot. Okay, the, I, 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 my question is to you, Adrian, about the opportunity cost of being responsible Imini. I mean, I mean sometimes it's for really, you know, Imini people needs to you know, pay a lot for being a responsible. Hello, I'm Yindra Chekhan from the Czech Republic and the US from Valuing Voices. Um, so I just had two, two quick questions for um, the gentleman whose name I can't believe I forgot on the left. Um, one is, Phil, the weighting of your uh, criteria because, for instance, in the U.S., an innovation without looking at the profitability is dead in the water. So that's one. And the second one was um, to what, how do we manage uh, these definitions of innovation across cultures. So in the US, one would use your rubric very differently. If we're going to Zambia, we need to bridge those definitions across cultures, and how do we then go do it? Uh, I'm Marcelo, I'm uh, from Brazil. I work uh, here in the Netherlands for the Royal Tropical Institute uh, kit. So my question is uh, f for, uh, for both of you. Uh, I found very interesting wh what you, you're looking at, and. Um, uh, and I found very interesting that in one of your, your tables you said you have to think about what we don't know when you're thinking of innovation. But usually what com comes back to bite us is what we don't know that we don't know. So you have the problem with the known unknowns, but actually the big issue with the unknowns unknowns. And uh, I'd like to know how we incorporate that in a, in a pra practical way. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Jules. I'm from uh, IUCN in Switzerland. Uh, I just have a question. Uh, from the NRM perspective, which other sectors have gone through this sort of transformational process that you have both described from different perspectives, but which other sector has gone through that process um, the best or is the most advanced that the NRM sector can really learn from in terms of strategies and processes that can help us, you know, get to that sort of more uh, innovative, friendly uh, monitoring and evaluation? The weighting of the criteria, well, I, I have to say that has to be kind kind of contextual. There's no you, you can't a prioritize this. So um, uh, you know it, it has to be done on on a case by case context, um, and and it depends uh, on on the case in point, on the culture in point, on the issue in point, on the governance institutions in po uh, you know in point. So. Um, so, so I think it's you know I think the key thing is at least for the framework is that we're developing it's an integrated framework, and uh, and so I think that's what you know is is a little bit different about it, and I think the key uh, the the new actor, and the one that's always the most difficult is how do you, the governance institutions themselves become responsive to those processes. So 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 I think that's the only thing I can answer that. Managing definitions across cultures is an extremely interesting question. We, we, we just had a workshop in Brazil, actually, looking at uh, response to innovation across borders. And, uh, and I think that there's a danger, one of the dangers is that if we don't, if we're not sensitive to the different uh, contexts, cultures, uh, s social dynamics, uh, across you know different places, then it could become a kind of an imperial tool, and um, you know I, I've just been part of a, a project, and um, and that's precisely inadvertently that what it was going to happen. So the people who were leading, you know, very good, well-minded technology assessment people, you know Germans, but you know others as well, they they they, they kind of thought, well, let's have a global dialogue. 
but then and and then let's involve Brazil and Zambia, God knows whoever else is in this discussion. But there was no engagement with uh, how those concepts might travel across borders, and and without that, it could be just an imperialist tool. So so I think how you structure that. I mean, we're at the moment we, we've got a special issue, the journal Response Innovation, where we're trying to. Uh, give some serious consideration to precisely those questions. So, and I think that starts really from the idea of when you think it's, when you sort of have the mistaken belief that it's a thing, and you know what the thing is, and then the question is, well, how do you have this thing going on? And, and that's the danger of the European pillar approach. So it's about gender equality, open access, you know, scientific education, and so that's what it is. You know what it is, so therefore you need to look at, well, What's the state of the art? We have all these state of the art projects, and as if you, you as if you can determine what the thing is by then going to find out what it is and finding out what the state of the art is, and then you can improve it. Which again is is you know potentially hugely misdirected because again it presumes you know, and you have all this European money uh, being thrown at the state of the art projects, which again. Uh, uh, are likely to be very problematic in, in power terms and to, you know, in terms of the viability of the concept. Um, and t in terms of the unknown unknowns, yeah, I mean, that I in a sense, that's precisely um, the starting point of the project, you know, the Donald Rumsfeld sense, the things we know, the things we know we don't know, the things, you know, but then the, 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 the things we don't know, we don't know. And that's quite, and that's it. And this is not a, you know, this is not a magic ball. We don't, we're not going to identify these unknown unknowns. But what, what we are doing is, is asking a different set of questions, a range of questions, and importantly, having disciplinary competence to enable you to ask those questions. And, um, and that's as good as it can get. You know, it's not to say we're going to find out these unknowns and knowns, but we're, 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 we're much more likely to. I mean, this whole thing started with us when we did a project for, for actually for Unilever in 1996. And uh, we did it on, on GM foods. And uh, at the moment, everybody thought, well, you know, we're going to regulate, not much of an issue. Some NGOs were pretty angry about it, but that was it. So, so we de developed a, an anticipative upstream publication project and we find out that at the level of the publics once you uh, didn't accept the framing of GMOs that the regulators and industry were, were promoting that actually it was an incredibly deep issue and a very traumatic one at which people felt incredibly uneasy with questions of trust and purpose and nature and messing so we presented this report which of course was completely ignored by Unilever at the time but uh, you know, w which actually was only was done principally to help Unilever interact with wider societal actors, and then two years later the issue blew up, and everyone said, "Well, why didn't we anticipate it?" And then we had our report, so you know, which was very interesting at the time. So, uh, and uh, you know, it's not to say that uh, that will happen all the time, but it'll give you a much better chance to actually help anticipate and importantly help anticipate the factors that then are likely to drive responses. So, so I think that's my response to, to that one. In terms of sectors, I mean, I, I think again this is, depends on the particular um, sort of cultures of science and governance that they're in place. Uh, I mean, I, I, you know, and, and you know, I know that in where you have very hierarchical cultures, very traditional scientific cultures, then things are incredibly difficult so, and, and very, very challenging. Uh, so, so actually, we, we, we're struggling with how we can create a space to open up these discussions, for example, in Brazil, which is very, very hard because they don't see there's a problem. And scientists think that they know and they don't really feel they need to talk to society you know, and, and all the rest of it. So it's very, very complicated. Sectors that have worked well are either sectors where there has been a problem and therefore they think they need to do something about it. So after the GMO saga, it was a very good space to open up some of those questions or after BSC. Sectors that also work well, certainly in the UK, we find the engineers far more receptive than the biologists 
and the engine, and that's very interesting. I, I don't know if it's you know quite what it is. I think they are much more open to change. They like building and doing. You know, they're not so much hypothesis driven. So, uh, you know, so so you know that they've been much more receptive, and also I think um, the engineers haven't had the trauma of uh, biotechnology to to deal with, and uh, and and where the, the biologists had, you know, I don't think still have recovered. So from that trauma, at least in the UK to some extent, so the engineers are, are much more open, especially to open to planar relationships with the social sciences. As an engineer, <laughs> we have the small little detail of the World Commission on dams built by engineers, um, where there was... Um, I think that there we certainly have our v our share of a lot of um, floundering and problems for sure. Um, <coughs> okay, uh, wow, great questions. Um, just some thoughts. I the don't know what don't know. I mean that's a passion I have. I think it's such an underdeveloped area. We don't we don't know enough about about that. Um, and. I think it comes back to me with, for me to, qu are we asking questions that allow us to at least have the space to explore that? But there's another, there's a few other, I suppose, kind of tooly type ideas that I've been playing around with a little bit. Um, w it's, it's, and it's very much about voice. So we've got to have, um, a d d those of you who've read Dave Stoden, he talks about having anticipatory awareness, very similar to your and and putting antennas out there you know you've got to have voices in places um, where you don't uh, normally have voices um, and you've got to ask them uh, ask people uh, in ways that aren't filtered through uh, what it is that you're wanting to see so that i think that requires two things it, it requires a lot of investment in putting these so-called nodes in place you know having constant forums and discussions about well, what's changing in the system. And so it requires a lot more investment um, that in, in having discussions about uh, what might be emerging in a particular situation. Um, weak signals, um, get really paying attention to that. I, get, I think it goes against uh, often what the Yemeni sector is con contracted for. We're contracted to look at the big signals, yeah? Is it happening or not? It's, um, but what about those little outliers there? And the, uh, what's good, actually I should have put that on the slide as well, positive deviance, I mean that responds to your, your question as well, Jules, a bit, is positive, if we can find positive deviance examples in our world related to M&E and responsible innovation, that would be great. But, but positive deviance and building that into your M&E system so that you can start to, and into your planning system, I think that would be a really interesting entry point to figure out, well, what can we learn that we don't know we might need to know from that? And there's some work going on in, in the sector around that. Um, I'm not sp sure I can speak to a lot of other issues. Uh, <coughs> oh yeah, the big challenges for, um, to be honest, it's not about tools and it's not about methods and it's not, it's about the politics. It's about the politics of organizations. It's about um, th the culture of results orientation that the whole M&E sector historically has really been burdened by and is getting tighter. I was at a presentation um, by the Catholic Relief Service. They've had 20 years of funding in Nicaragua. And they said, in the beginning, we only needed to be we were on, our, on our accountability side. I think it was four indicators. Now they have six. They had six PowerPoint slides that in the, la the latest. So it's, it's also a tightening. It's actually a worsening. Um, so how you deal with that is really comp I, I don't know. Um, we've been talking about it uh, with this initiative called the Politics of, of Evidence. Um, it's about uh, trying to create space to insert different questions in the kind of m and &E work that you commission, if you're in a commissioning position. It's about creating space to push through some of these big questions, these questions like Dorothy Luke's, the example from IFAD Philippines. You know, she, she had to figure out how to maneuver 
uh, relationships and what was expected of her to still be able to insert the issues that mattered. So it's a very political maneuvering that has to go on. Uh, so I think that's a really, really huge um, issue. There is innovation happening, but the innovation tends to be more around data collection methods. And I don't think that that's a particularly interesting area of innovation. I think where the challenges lie are around sense making, around surprises. Uh, we don't do enough innovation around that. Um, so the challenges are embedded in the system and why things get funded and how they get funded and how people are being held accountable and that they're being held accountable. Um, yeah. Did just to uh, supplement the final point, I think, um, again, just through through our experience, one, one th what one aspect that matters an awful lot is leadership and confidence, and uh, and 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 this the, the, this and leadership and confidence to experiment, uh, leadership in in the direction that the organisation is going, um, and uh, w without having to feel that everything has to be meticulously justified by numbers all the time. That that's a sort of a disincentive. So certainly, uh, certainly with the research that kind uh, research council experience, where there was uh, a lot of openness, uh, openness to experiment in different ways, um, uh, openness that this might fail, um, that 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 made it that made an enormous difference uh, institutionally. Hi. Um, I, I would like to ask whether there is uh, a link being made between the new SDG agenda, which according to uh, uh, the, the UN Secretary General is kind of a transformative agenda that encompasses pl planetary boundaries, so social impact, and economic progress, and innovations in terms of M&E. Thank you very much. My name is Shmim Heather, and my question is, the how can we make the acceptability of uh, monitoring, especially keeping in view the uh, responsible innovation? Because the uh, project uh, implementers uh, can see or perceive this is the inspection. Like, so how can we uh, make it uh, you know, friendly or acceptability specifically? Thank you. Hi, my name is Anna Audis. I work for Oxfam. I have a question on um, the relationship between anticipation and the uh, calling which control dilemma, especially like how can we, you said it was the calling, calling which control dilemma? Yeah. When we, when the technology is young enough to influence a future tra trajectory, you cannot know where it will lead. And when you're more advanced, it's too late to influence. Um, so how do you then anticipate in early stage the possible consequences and what is an acceptable level of risk to take in innovation because I think without taking any risks there's no innovation and then we also not solving all the problems we face um, um, many cases you uh, Henny from uh, my name is Henny Ibrahim from Egypt many cases you presented and the many cases will be discussed later uh, always link it to technology, uh, agricultural, science, but uh, I, uh, I would like to hear uh, something about uh, social science, social movements, politics, democratization. Uh, as you know that Egypt is one of the Arab countries in transition, and I would like it to uh, trace innovation in, in, in such uh, uh, big issues of democratization, human rights, and uh, social movements. Thank you. Okay, so so thanks. So the first point is the um, the social the, the sustainable development agenda and I, mean, I, I I don't know. I can say that, but but I do think there is a very interesting set of potential connections to be made between the sustainable de development goals and a responsible innovation agenda, and I I think that that work just hasn't been done, but it should be done, and I think it would be extremely important. Um, uh, so, so in a sense, uh, the response to innovation idea has come out of a different set of traditions. So it's come out of a uh, science and technology studies tradition predominantly. And, uh, and then there's work to link that to a, a, a development studies tradition and set of debates. 
Now, some of that work has begun to take place uh, predominantly at the, in Sussex, at the Step Centre, which is a very innovative centre linking those two kinds of uh, uh, sub-disciplines. And, uh, and, and I think actually at, at Wagen the, there's a, an opportunity, not least in the groups that have been in whatever, to, to, to really push through that agenda. In terms of the inspection role, I, I, I quite agree. And, and I think um, in a sense that is why we're kind of focusing on the other dimensions of responsibility. It's not just about being liable or being accountable which is a backward-looking sense of responsibility, but is opening up to these other dimensions of care and responsiveness. So, so I think the more that within the monitoring evaluation community that they can begin to evaluate these forward future dimensions, then they will be seen less as an inspector and more as an enabler, potentially, if that's followed through. Uh, in terms of the control dilemma question, um, the, it, the anticipation link does not solve the control dilemma. The control dilemma is always going to be there. Uh, and the response innovation framework is never going to properly anticipate, you know, to predict futures, but it's going to enable better capacities that will, uh, that will then provide more uh, thoughtful intelligence about potential and plausible futures, which then can inform better decision-making and make decisions more robust and thus likely to be uh, potentially more future-proof. So, so that, 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 that's, and it's really to do with the capacities rather than the predictive powers of the processes. Uh, and, and, and that also links to the other point, which is to say that part of that uh, protective capacities is that more voices are included, so there's an explicit commitment to include voices that tend not to be included. Uh, and, and I think that's where the connection uh, then goes towards democratization, towards engagement with social movements, uh, especially in governance discussions uh, and the examples that I've been involved with, that those discussions basically exclude those voices because they're seen as technical discussions where you require technical knowledge to participate in those discussions. And, uh, and, and that's a fascinating issue. So, for example, in the, in the, in the research I was involved with, which was on uh, GMOs, on, on transgenic agriculture, the assumption was well, you cannot have a conversation with you know, ordinary publics. It's not possible. They're, they're, they're too ignorant. They, they need specialist knowledge. And so part of what we are able to do is to say, actually, well, we have developed methodologies where you can. It's perfectly possible to do this in Brazil and Mexico. You don't need to be European to do that. You know? And it's really interesting because then you see the issues that European publics are concerned about with GM actually are quite parallel. Of course, there are some differences, but there's an awful lot of commonalities. And, and, and it's an unsettling technology, not least for the power dimensions, wherever you go. Well, it's, it's, it comes back to this, the culture, of course, of um, and entrenched ideas of what m and &E people should do and the terms of reference that they sign off on. Um, it's a really difficult one because often m and &E people are at the bottom of the ladder <laughs> and um, they are hired uh, for data. <laughs> and um, the relationships to management are um, you know, as like a, a funnel for, for providing that data. Um <coughs> one of the I'm trying to think of the example, but I couldn't, I couldn't pinpoint the example, is can we somehow get m and &E people or management to, to sign off on values rather than on deliverables? 
or rather make values the deliverables. Because then you can get away from, oh goodness, you know, you only reach 27.36% of your target. Um, but you can get back to saying, well, are we on the road towards more equity or on, are we on the road towards um, more sustainability? Or, and I find organizational values a very powerful reorienting compass. I mean, I use them to get people back to the basics often because they get so bogged down in the micro detail of what they think they should be delivering. Um, and so at various levels, I think that that's a really powerful uh, process. Um, I don't know who's expected to be friendly to whom, um, but I remember listening to a, a talk that Melissa Leach, who uh, was in, is in the step, was, is? Yeah, she, 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 she set it up, up. yeah. To IDS, yeah. IDS. So she was involved in this, and she gave a really, f I, I found it really touching almost. She said, it's not about whose voice matters or who's, you know, because everyone's talking, asking these questions in development, whose blah matters, you know, who's, who's, she said it's about whose futures matter. And I think this notion of whose futures matter is a really critical one when it comes to responsible innovation and some of the urgency of the challenges that I mentioned. Uh, because who decides whose futures matter? Yeah, it's kind of a, this chicken and egg situation. But bringing it back to this notion of being friendly, you know, this, fr this how can m and &E people or how can the m and &E function not be associated with, you know, the death blow and is, is to get back to are we serving, you know, is, is what you're doing serving the future of the people whose futures matter? So it's, it's actually bumping it up. To a, a kind of a higher level of abstraction that's value driven. Um, I don't know, coming back to the SDG agenda, um, I don't know that there's any innovation of ME happening that, that is, makes it um, sit well. Um, I think that that's where I, it comes back to the politics. Often the ME systems don't change, even though the intentions change. Um, and that was one thing that I liked, but. You know, I'll be shot, I think, in the room now, about what Lillian Plumen said. Um, she's the Minister of Foreign Affairs and whatever, and uh, trade, sorry, I don't know what the latest title is. Um, she's, she changed what NGOs were allowed to be funded for, and she made very, very clear that they were now allowed, they were, they were allowed to, well, they were only allowed to do po policy and advocacy work, lobby work, but she recognized that the nature of the work demanded a very different type of m and &E and results logic, or not logic, even um, uh, forms of accountability. And she's one of the few people who I've heard actually at that level speak about that understanding that the accountability and learning systems have to fit with the nature of what it is you're looking at. Yeah, this, it's often very disconnected. Okay. Yeah, so uh, my statement is uh, I wasn't sure what to expect at this conference, and uh, I'm, I'm absolutely surprised and delighted by the quality of the interaction so far. As, and I think it's a, it's a, I have never really thought about this issue of monitoring and evaluation this way. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm really excited about um, how this community, and I've probably got all sorts of prejudices about the community. Um, maybe, you know, having not just a, 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 you know, a really insightful but a productive conversation. So, so, so yeah, so I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. I get, it's very similar to, um, to what Phil was saying, that I, when I was looking at your slides, I thought, wow, there are so many hooks here that we can use to push ourselves and that makes sense to push the, ba the, pa the, the fr frontiers of where we need to innovate with M&E. But I guess I'm very excited by the concept of responsibility because I think it can push us away from the straitjacket of accountability and deliverables that bog us all down. <laughs> <laughs>